Hello and welcome to session three, the five traits of true probiotics. This is microbiologist and holistic health advocate, Michelle Moore. Now the last session, I covered the common myths and pitfalls surrounding the use of traditional probiotics. And I also talked about the importance of uh, finding strains that actually can survive through the harsh stomach environment, all that harsh acid, and finding strains that can colonize the gut. And that probiotic strains, if they don't match an individual's native microbiome, a species that's already been there, that probiotic may not be able to bind or function in harmony within the microbiome, and you won't get the health benefits from that particular probiotic. So let's discuss what really makes a true probiotic. So now that we have a better understanding of the human microbiome, let's discuss five traits of a probiotic uh, that would be ideal with this new understanding. First of all, this probiotic should be able to survive its passage through the stomach, through all the stomach acid. Second of all, it would be a species that can survive in both aerobic and anaerobic um, conditions, meaning it can survive in the air and it can survive without air. This probiotic would need to be able to actually colonize and set up a home inside of the intestines, inside of the microbiome, and ideally one that also has an evolutionary significance. Importantly, this probiotic should be able to shift the microbiome, to shift the balance to that of a favorable uh, species environment. This is different than the traditional reseeding approach of just trying to put some good bacteria in there and hope that they'll take over. And also, it needs to be safe, of course, with a long history of human use. So let's talk about surviving the stomach. Uh, your stomach is meant to be hostile to anything coming through it. It's, it's got a bunch of acid. Uh, I, obviously, that's also meant for digesting food, but it's meant to keep out any kind of hostile organisms. You don't want to get you know, food poisoning and whatnot. So it helps keep you from getting sick, but it also drastically reduces the potency of the traditional probiotics. Uh, so there was actually an interesting uh, study done by uh, Reading University in the United Kingdom along with the Food Standards Agency and they studied 35 different probiotic products and they set up uh, simulated stomach conditions and at the first batch they had a solution of pH 1 that mimics uh, actually stomach acid and they found that of all of the 35 products they tested, none of them were able to survive for 20 minutes at a pH of 1, which is an optimal stomach um, pH. That just means it's really acidic. I think uh, soda is around pH 2 or 3, somewhere in there. Now the second solution they had was a pH of 2 to 3, and they found of the 35, only um, roughly half of 18 of those survived. And of those 18, only six showed any kind of survivability, basically after exposure to bile acid salts, which are gonna also be found in the intestines. And of those six, only four of the strains tested showed any viability in intestinal conditions. So basically, of the 35 products tested, only four of them uh, actually made it into intestinal type conditions alive. That's a, a pretty dismal survival rate. Another study was performed by Silkier, and they took uh, two different types of yogurt, uh, Chobani and Danon, and also a leading commercial probiotic uh, called Ultimate Flora Critical Care. And they subjected those uh, three products to another simulated stomach acid environment, and they found that there was a less than 1% uh, survival rate of the probiotics uh, when it was subjected to a pH of 1.3 and bile salts. So again, um, it just again shows the 
issue with getting traditional type probiotics through the stomach barrier. Now, on the other hand, uh, spore-based probiotics actually will survive the journey through the stomach acid intact and through the bile salts just fine because uh, spores are like uh, seeds. They're a hard protective shell and they're designed that once the spore encounters favorable conditions, like once it gets to a happy place in your gut, it will then sporulate or germinate in, in a sense and a live cell uh, of the probiotic comes out and uh, then can populate your intestines. Another trait of true probiotics um, would be that they would be facultative anaerobes, which means they're able to grow in both oxygen and no oxygen. So the majority of uh, your gut bacteria that live in your intestines and your colon they are strict anaerobes. They cannot tolerate the presence of oxygen. If, if they were exposed um, to oxygen, they would immediately die. Now, a lot of the traditional common probiotics are grown in labs, and as I talked about before, they came from the dairy industry, uh, fermented uh, product strains that they were able to grow in the lab, and a lot of these strains are aerobic meaning they grow in the presence of oxygen. So if you take a, a strain of bacteria that grows in oxygen and, and put it in an environment where there is none, they're going to die. It's basically like trying to plant fish in a desert and expecting that the fish will survive and they just won't. And this is actually another reason why a lot of traditional probiotics um, are not effective. So what you want is a species uh, of probiotic that can grow both aerobically and anaerobically and uh, those will make a hardier strain of probiotic and one example of that are the spore formers called bacillus species. Now a true probiotic uh, should also be a natural part of the human gut and the environment. As I've talked about before, a lot of probiotics that if they aren't a, a unique to you, they're not going to fit in your microbiome. There's not going to be an intestinal binding site. Uh, if that probiotic uh, isn't native to you, it's not going to compete well against the native species uh, or your immune system won't recognize it and try to destroy it and basically it's not just going to function well in harmony. So you're going to want a strain that's actually not unique to just you, but is found among all microbiomes. Another interesting study done uh, showed that the majority of commercial probiotic strains really don't even bind well once they get to the intestines. So that reduces their ability to you know, function as a probiotic and get in there and, and do some good. So they actually studied 11 different types of lactobacillus and the best strain showed a 38% rate of binding and that was for lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, 38%. So the other, you know, large percent would not bind and was, was lost basically. The next best strain was a lactobacillus ruteri, and it had a binding rate of 24%. So most commercial probiotic species are not actually found in nature. Uh, when you look at bifidobacteria and lactobacillus, which are the majority of commercial probiotics, you don't find those uh, in the environment where people would actually encounter these bacteria in large numbers. Uh, you get them when you're born and when you're a child and they're supplied to you through the birth canal, through the mother's breast milk and contact with the mother. So they're not actually something um, people encounter a lot. So when you think about an evolutionary significance to a probiotic, um, first of all, is it natural and have humans, uh, have they co-evolved with it or co-created with this particular probiotic? Uh, is there a probiotic that's both in the environment and also in the microbiome? And 
Actually, there's been studies done on hunter-gatherer tribes, uh, people who live off the land, basically, who hunt and uh, gather food. And they have been shown to have much more diverse microbiomes, meaning they have much more, many more species uh, in their microbiomes than people uh, do in the modernized world. And they also um, find that hunter-gatherers are lacking many of the diseases that people in the Western world struggle with. So again, this likely ties back to the strength of that strong, diverse microbiome. So what's in the environment? Well, there's um, soil-based spore-forming bacteria like bacillus. And these bacillus species are actually found in the, the intestinal tract of insects, animals, and humans. And because they're spread across these uh, variety of groups, it indicates uh, the function as a universal uh, probiotic. Now bacillus species, these spore-forming bacillus, are also adapted to life outside of the human intestinal tract. And studies so far appear um, to show that these bacillus species are designed to be transferred through the environment. Uh, they have the ability to colonize and live in multiple types of hosts and survive in the environment. And that shows an evolutionary significance as a probiotic that you don't see with bifidobacteria and lactobacillus and other species. Another ideal trait of a true probiotic would be one of being able to shift the microbiome. Now we've already been talking at length about traditional uh, probiotic approaches, the reseeding approach. However, this has the great limitations of these strains generally not surviving well through the uh, stomach and not being able to bind well if they do make it through the stomach and uh, there's a lot of challenges with this traditional approach. However, there are the spore-forming bacillus species, and these actually have been found to have the ability to favor the growth of resident good bacteria. Uh, these spore-forming bacillus actually can alter the number of resident bacteria of the microbiome, and they can shift it towards health-promoting bacteria. Therefore, we don't have to try to match up an exact strain that belongs in your microbiome because bacillus species are generally found, they're pretty much found in everybody's microbiome. So if you can get that particular bacillus species in there, then it can start favoring the growth of your good lactobacillus and bifidobacteria and other species that create a healthy microbiome. Now, bacillus spore formers also have enhanced benefits. They uh, do a, a good provoking of the immune system. So if you're dealing with uh, an infection or a GI overgrowth, they're going to provide a good boost to the immune system. They've also been shown to have anti-inflammatory effects in both uh, the gut and the body. They help with tissue healing, and they also can police the gut against disease-causing organisms, and we're going to talk more about that in session four and five. All right, another trait of a true probiotic is that it should be safe for use with humans. And first off, I have to say that overall, <clears throat> probiotics are extremely safe to use, and they've been eaten by people in various forms for thousands of years. However, sometimes there may be certain disease conditions that warrant some caution around uh, certain strains of probiotics, one being lactobacillus acidophilus. Sometimes that's problematic for people with Crohn's disease. So be sure to speak with your nutritionally oriented doctor on what's best for you, especially if you have a specific uh, disease condition. Now, bacillus species, these are the spore formers, they live in the soil, and that means they're in the dust, they're in the air, they're in the water, they're on produce. They've been eaten by humans uh, for a very long time, for thousands of years. They're even um, in natto, which is a fermented food that's found in Asia. 
And you can look at ice cores uh, from glaciers going well back over 20,000 years, and there's still uh, bacillus spores that are located all over. Another trait about bacillus is they are universal in the human microbiome, meaning that everybody has a spot for some of these specific strains we'll talk about coming up. And so that's great because you know when you take one of these strains, once it survives your stomach and arrives in your uh, colon, it will have a place that it can go ahead and set up a home. Now, as I mentioned before, um, the spore forms of bacillus, there's two forms. The one is the spore, which is like a hard seed, and it will um, be delivered in capsules in the spore form so it can survive the uh, passage through the harsh, uh, low pH environment of the stomach and arrive alive uh, in your gut when it finds a good spot when it lands in the intestine and the colon it will then germinate and become a live form of the probiotic. It can withstand heat and even the presence of antibiotics when it's in that spore form. And like I said, once it arrives in the intestines it will uh, basically produce a new alive cell. And bacillus species have been used as probiotics for a very long time all across the world, and they're one of the most well-known, uh, widely studied species of probiotics that survives both in the environment and inside the gut. And of course, uh, if you have any health condition, and especially if you're immunocompromised, be sure to talk to your doctor before starting any particular probiotic. Okay, so bacillus uh, probiotic species are all spore-based, so they'll be able to survive the uh, acidic environment of your stomach and arrive into your intestines and colon where they'll set up home. And there's been numerous studies showing that they are able to do that and survive. They can survive in both oxygen environments, like the transition from manufacturer to arriving in your home and sitting in your cupboard for quite some time and while you're traveling. Those are all oxygen environments and they won't uh, lose their potency over time. And then they'll also survive in a no oxygen environment like in your colon. Bacillus probiotics are also normal human microbiome residents, which is a very important thing that we've talked about already. And they also have enhanced benefits for uh, shifting the microbiome into a more favorable uh, type of flora. And we'll discuss this more in some upcoming sessions. And bacillus probiotic species, they've had a long history of human use, even in fermented foods, and they meet all the requirements of a true probiotic. So be sure to attend session four where I'll be discussing how to use probiotics for active infection challenges, ways that you can maximize uh, getting the most benefit from probiotics. And thank you for attending session three.